So this is the start of probably a long path towards documenting on the web via these videos, the basics of the theory of vertex operator algebras and what are some interesting problems in vertex operator algebras. So this video is gonna be a fairly self-contained and a fairly followable uh, motivation towards the definition of a vertex algebra. So we'll spend most of our time looking at simpler algebraic structures and kind of motivate how a vertex algebra is some sort of simultaneous generalization of all of these simpler algebraic structures. We'll end with some motivation for why this thing should exist in the first place, what it's useful for, and make a quick look at the definition. Okay, so I wanna start with something that's fairly straightforward, and that is an associative algebra. So an associative algebra is a vector space, we'll call it A, over a field K. I will say that most of the time we use the field of the complex numbers together with an associative bilinear product. So what I mean by that is the following. So for all X, Y, Z, and A, so those are in the associative algebra, and alpha is in K, so that's, it, that's in the base field. So since we're a vector space over the base field, we need to have a notion of scalar multiplication, so that's gonna be built into this. Okay, so we've got associativity of the product. So in other words, X times Y, and then times z is the same thing as x times y times z. And then we've got this fact where we can factor out the scalar multiplication. So if you take alpha x times y, that's the same thing as alpha times xy. That's the same thing as x times alpha y. So notice this is not commutativity. This is just being able to factor out a scalar multiple. And then next you've got these two distributive rules. And so if you take x times y plus z, you get xy plus xz. And if you take x plus y times z, you get xz plus yz. So I think what you'll notice is that this is pretty close to the definition of a ring. It's just a ring with some extra structure. And in fact, it's really just a ring with the structure of a vector space and then some extra rules to go along with the operations in that ring. Okay, so let's look at some nice examples. So maybe the best and simplest example is one that everyone probably already knows, and that's the example of square matrices. So let's maybe write that as, we'll say A is equal to M, and then N times N, and let's say our base field is C, although we could take anything as our base field. So this would be an example of an algebra. We know that if we have X, Y, and Z that are all N by N matrices, we know that all of these things over here hold. So maybe I'll just write that as one through four hold. And that's pretty easy to check. We know that the associativity of um, multiplication of matrices is true. We know that we've got this distributive rule for multiplication of matrices. We know we've got this rule with scalar multiplication and multiplication of matrices, so we're kind of okay here. And then maybe notice that we do not have commutativity. So this is an, an associative algebra that is non-commutative. And that's important because sometimes you'll have associative and commutative algebras. Sometimes you'll just have an associative algebra. And later we'll see that you can have a non-associative algebra. So this is non-commutative. So in general, x times y is not equal to y times x. For matrices to commute under matrix multiplication, they have to be like pretty related to each other. So that's like one good example. Another good example is maybe a polynomial algebra. So I'll maybe write that as C of X. So this is gonna be polynomials with variable X whose coefficients are complex numbers. So maybe we can write this as A0 plus A1X plus all the way up to A N X to the N. And here we're taking N to be bigger than or equal to zero. So that means we can have constant polynomials as well, and maybe all of these A's, so A, I are all complex numbers. And what's going on with the multiplication here? Well, our multiplication here is just multiplication of polynomials. So if we take P of X and Q of X and C adjoin X, then we just have P of X times Q of X. That's the multiplication, but we know that well, polynomials form a ring. That's like one of the most important rings to study in abstract algebra. And so this most definitely forms a ring, but then it's also clearly a vector space and all of these things hold.
Okay, good. And then we could also have polynomials in infinitely many variables. And this is maybe a really important example um, for the case of a vertex algebra because some vertex algebras are in essence linearly polynomials in infinitely many variables. So maybe we could write that like this. So C adjoin X1, X2, X3, and so on and so forth. So these are polynomials in variables, x1, x2, x3, and so on and so forth. So we could maybe write this as the sum over capital I of A sub capital I and then x sub capital I1 um, all the way up to x sub I n. So where, let's see, I is some sort of n tuple, so it's running our sum is running over n tuples and then our coefficient here a sub i that's just a complex number great so obviously this is like a bit more complicated but it's really just a polynomial ring with infinitely many variables there's nothing else going on here here we've got a single variable here we have infinitely many variables but this kind of thing still holds. Notice if you multiply polynomials, um, it's associative, it's commutative in this case, which is important to point out that both of these are commutative. So these are examples of associative and commutative algebras. Okay, so now that we've got this notion of an associative algebra and an associative commutative algebra, let's go ahead and get rid of this and we'll look at the notion of a Lie algebra. So we just got done looking at the notion of an associative algebra and an associative commutative algebra. Now we want to look at a special type of non-associative algebra known as a Lie algebra. So a Lie algebra, we'll call it G, this fancy G right here, is a vector space over a field K. Again, we'll usually take the complex numbers that has a bilinear product. We usually call that bilinear product this bracket. And so it allows us to put two inputs in, both from G and get an output from G. And that follows these four rules. So for all x, y, z, and g, so in other words, in the Lie algebra, and alpha and k, the base field, we know that x with x is zero. And so this is also called anti-symmetry. And it follows that if x with x is zero, then x with y is the same thing as minus y comma x. So there's some sort of anti-commutativity here. Then next, if we have this element from the field, so alpha x with y is the same thing as alpha times bracket x y, which is the same thing as bracket x comma alpha y. So in other words, we can like put this scalar multiple anywhere we want. Then next, we've got this um, distributive rule, and I only wrote one version of the distributive rule. The other version will follow from maybe this thing up here and that is that x plus y comma z is the same thing as x comma z plus y comma z. So that's exactly the distributive rule here. It's just our product is being written with these brackets instead of with just like putting the two things together or using a dot or something. Then finally, our most important rule here is something called the Jacobi identity. And this like controls the non-associativity of the product. So this product is not associative, but it follows this kind of associative identity. So if we do bracket x comma bracket yz plus bracket y comma bracket xz plus bracket z comma bracket xy, we get zero. Okay, so now that we've got this definition of a Lie algebra, let's look at some important examples. So maybe the easiest example to get at can be built off of our associative algebra. So let's say we've got A and it is any associative algebra. So commutative, non-commutative, it's actually a little bit more interesting if it's non-commutative. And so we can define bracket going from A cross A to A by X comma Y is equal to X Y minus Y X. So in other words, it's like the commutator of the associative product. And you can check that this bracket in an associative product satisfies this Jacobi identity down here and it satisfies everything else. That's actually a good exercise and it's not so hard. Maybe really important examples 
from this are the type of matrix associative algebras that we had seen before. In particular, uh, maybe this most important simple Lie algebra called SL2. So SL2, so this is going to be all matrices of the form A, A, B, C, D, where A plus D equals zero. In other words, they have trace zero. So you can go ahead and check that this is spanned by three elements. Well, so that kind of makes sense because if we've got all two by two matrices, we have something what is just four dimensional. We introduce this one linear equation, so it should be three dimensional. This is the span of what is usually called H, E, and F. And here we have H is one, zero, zero, minus one. E is equal to zero, one, zero, zero. And then F is zero, zero, one, zero. Good. So notice those all have trace zero. H is this sometimes called Carton element, which is the diagonal matrix. The next thing that you can check is that these satisfy the following rules. So if you do H with E, you'll get two times E. And this is where just where we're using this normal like bracket as commutator definition. If we do H with F, we get minus two F. That's actually really important that notice we're getting something back having to do with E after bracketing it with H. So, you know, maybe later we'll dive more into Lie algebras. Um, we definitely will if I take this like series, you know, all the way towards like building up VOAs from the beginning. And then finally we have E with F is going to be H. Great. So, and these are actually the only three products that we need because we can calculate all the other ones like using this anti-symmetry or whatever. Okay, great. And then maybe another example, um, which is familiar from calculus three, or maybe even a linear algebra class, would be three-dimensional vectors and the cross product. So I'll maybe write this like this. So we have R3 with cross. So that's just the cross product. You know, like the normal cross product from calculus three that you generally calculate by taking this determinant of a matrix that has first row I, J, K. So the cross product is non-associative, it's non-commutative, but it does satisfy this Jacobi identity down here. So generally when I'm teaching a calculus three, that's like one of the exercises that I have my students do. So that plays an important role as a Lie algebra as well. Okay, so now let's get rid of this, and now we're going to mash the notion of an associative algebra and a Lie algebra together into something called a Poisson algebra. Now we're ready to look at something called a Poisson algebra, which is essentially what you get if you nicely glue together an associative algebra and a Lie algebra. So let's look at it. A Poisson algebra has the structure of a Lie algebra and associative algebra with this rule being followed. So before we talk about this rule, let's see what I mean by this. This means that it's a vector space over a field and it has a bracket product which obeys all of the rules of a Lie algebra. So it's bilinear, it's anti-symmetric, it obeys the Jacobi identity, and it has an associative product that's also bilinear that obviously satisfies all the rules of an associative algebra. And we want to see how those two products work together, the associative product and the Lie product. And they have to satisfy this rule. So here by putting Y and Z next to each other like that, I mean that is the associative product. But then putting things inside a bracket, that is the Lie product. So if I do X with Y times Z, that should be the same thing as bracket XY times z plus y times bracket xz. Okay, so there's some sort of nice structure that has to be followed with these two products together, and this is it right here. So this is sometimes called the Leibniz rule. Maybe convince yourselves why this really looks like the Leibniz rule, which is another word for the product rule from calculus. All right, so let's go ahead and maybe look at some examples. So in fact, there's like a very simple example immediately, and that would be the example of an associative algebra where we take its Lie algebra and just kind of mush them together. So let's say we've got A, which is an associative algebra, and then define bracket as bracket xy equals xy minus yx. 
And in fact, with this definition of the bracket and whatever is happening with the associative algebra, this satisfies this rule over here. And we can actually check that real quick. That's a nice little exercise to do. And that says that x comma yz, so that's gonna be xyz minus yzx. And now what we're gonna do is add zero into that. And the zero that I'm going to add will be uh, yxz. So I'm gonna go ahead and plus yxz minus yxz. And now I'll recombine these in a certain way. So maybe I'll do this guy minus this guy, and then this guy minus this guy. So let's see what we get for that. So we have yxz minus yzx, and then plus xyz minus yxz. Good, but now notice I can go ahead and factor a y out of these first two terms. So I'll factor y out of these first two terms, I'll factor a z out of the right of these second two terms, and that'll give me y, and now I have xz minus zx plus x y minus y x and then z so we factored a z out of the right hand side but now notice that these commutators are really the bracket that's what we're using the definition of the bracket here so here we have y and then bracket x z plus bracket x y times z which is exactly this rule over here just with the addition switched up but the addition's commutative so that's okay so this is maybe a trivial example. I'll go ahead and race the board and we'll look at a non-trivial example. So maybe a more interesting example is something called the tensor algebra of a Lie algebra. So we're going to look at the special case when the Lie algebra is SL2. So remember that's spanned by E, F, and H like we saw before and that has the commutators that we had before. And the tensor algebra is actually the direct sum of every tensor power of the algebra SL2 in this case. So I've written this. This is the zeroth tensor power, which is just the ground field, which we'll take as C. And then we have this direct sum with one copy of SL2, direct sum with two tensored copies of SL2, and so on and so forth. So we can maybe write this all at once as the direct sum from n equals zero to infinity of the nth tensor power of SL2. So this may seem like something that is pretty scary, and I will admit it is a bit scary, but how you wanna think about this as just polynomials, and I'll put polynomials in heavy quotes with variables E, F, and H. Remember, E, F, and H span um, SL2. So if you've got like just your constant terms, those are gonna live in this part of the direct sum. If you have your linear terms, those are gonna live in this part of the direct sum. The quadratic terms will live in this part of the direct sum and so on and so forth. So like for example, if we have say the number two, that's gonna live in the complex numbers, that's the first part of the direct sum. And then if we have like E plus three H, so that's like a linear term, that is going to live in the second part of the direct sum, SL2. And then a quadratic term like E squared plus FH, that's gonna be in SL2 cross, sorry, tensor SL2. Where here, instead of putting the tensor between them, I'm just gonna kinda of write them next to each other. That's pretty standard and I put polynomials in quotes because it's not commutative. And so in fact, um, there is maybe like no rule for how to simplify these. So E, F, and F, E have no relation to each other. Now you can make them have a relation to each other by quotienting out by something, and that forms something called the universal enveloping algebra, but that is more of an associative algebra that you can encode with a Poisson algebra structure like we did on the last board. This is maybe a Poisson algebra structure just by itself. And so maybe what's the associative product? Well, the associative product is just like putting these guys next to each other and you view it as an associative product. And then the Lie product is inherited from the Lie product on SL2. So let's maybe look at an example of a commutator of things here and see how it goes. So let's do E squared with maybe um, F, yeah, 
So let's maybe do e squared with f. So maybe we could go ahead and write that as um, minus f with e times e. So notice I used my anti-symmetry to flip those. And then I wrote e times e instead of e squared. And I did that so that I could use this rule over here. So now I can go ahead and split this up. So this is going to be minus. And then notice here we've got xy. So xy here is going to be fe. So f with e. And then times e. So that's the z. And then plus e times. And this is going to be another fe just because of the structure here, fe. Great. But now I want to notice that Fe was equal to negative Ef because of the anti-symmetry again. So we can take this minus sign and just flip the order of those. So that'll give us E with F and an E on the right plus an E on the left and an E with F. And then like we said before, these have kind of known commutators. E with F is going to be H. So here we have He plus Eh. And now there's no real simplification you can do, again, because we're in this tensor algebra. There might be something we could do where we could commute this and pick up another term if we were in a so-called universal enveloping algebra, but we're not here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and clean this up, and then we'll look at um, how a VOA arises from these ideas. So let's see what we've done so far. We've defined the notion of an associative algebra. We looked at some examples, including some familiar ones like the algebra of matrices and the algebra of polynomials. So those are not too scary. Then we defined something called a Lie algebra and we looked at some examples. Again, we saw that we could define them out of matrices, just where the Lie bracket was the commutator. We could also get them from the cross product. Next, we glued those two ideas together into something called a Poisson algebra, which was a little bit trickier to get at an interesting example, but we did get an, at an interesting example. Now, we're going to take a deep breath and look at the definition of something called a vertex algebra. So a vertex algebra is a vector space equipped with infinitely many products. So let's go ahead and recall an associative algebra had a single product that was associative. A Lie algebra had a single product which was non-associative, well this thing has infinitely many products and you generally index them by the integers. So you really kind of want to think about it like u star n v, so that would be the nth way of multiplying u and v. But often we just write u sub n v and we leave the star out. So what we're doing here is we're multiplying u and v this nth way. And generally, you put all of those multiplications together into something called a vertex operator. So the vertex operator is this thing y. So we write it like this. So y of u comma z attacking v. So that's going to be the sum over all integers n. And then here, this is the nth multiplication of u with v and then times z to the minus n minus 1. And generally, z is a formal variable. Sometimes people take like a complex geometric view of it and it's living on some sort of compact complex manifold, but generally I'll just take it as a formal variable. So in other words, this is like a generating function. This thing right here is like a generating function for all of the different ways to multiply u with v. You just have to look at the appropriate um, coefficient of the appropriate power of z here. Okay, now this has to satisfy four axioms. So the first axiom has to do with this thing called a vacuum element. So there is a special element inside V called the vacuum. That's like the identity for multiplication. We usually call it this bold script one. And it has the following rule that if you plug it into the vertex operator and you attack a vector, you just get the vector back. So I want to go ahead and point out that what this means is that one sub negative one times V is equal to V but 1 sub n times v is equal to 0, and that's going to be for all n not equal to negative 1. So there's something special about this negative first multiplication. Okay, great. Now, the next thing we have is this thing called the creation axiom. And that says that if you take v and do the minus first multiplication with the vacuum, you just create v itself.
So you create the particle V or whatever. And then V sub N attacking the vacuum is equal to zero for all N bigger than or equal to zero. And so this is, has to do with the kind of idea that you have this lowest weight or maybe this um, lowest possible energy and hitting V with N on the vacuum goes lower than that lowest possible weight, which it's zero up there. Okay, the next you have this thing which is maybe the most important, it's called weak commutativity or locality. And that says for all elements u and v, which are in the vertex algebra, there is a natural number n so that if you take the commutator of these vertex operators and you hit it with an appropriate power of z minus w to the n, you'll get zero. So notice this means that these guys do not commute unless the n is equal to zero, then you get a commutativity here, but in general, these things do not commute. Um, and the value of n kind of measures how bad they are at commuting. Then finally, you've got this other operator called T. It's sometimes called the translation operator. It's a linear operator on the vector space that satisfies the following rule. So if we put it inside of the vertex operator, and pull it outside, it's the same thing as taking the derivative with respect to z. So it like translates something to a higher weight, if you will. Okay, so now let's maybe put this in the idea of an associative algebra, a Lie algebra, and a Poisson algebra to really get an idea for how this goes. And then we'll pretty much be done. It's too much to do a nice example of this right now. We'll come back to this if there's enough interest. Okay, so here's how you wanna think about this. You wanna start at this negative first multiplication. So let's say we've got two elements, u and v, inside of our vector space or our vertex algebra. We go down here to the negative first multiplication. So this is somehow the nicest multiplication. And so here's how you want to think about this. This is very close. So I'll put that in quotes because I'm not going to define that right now. But this is close to being an associative commutative structure. Slash commutative. Maybe we'll say product. So that's what I mean by nice here. This is very, very close to being an associative commutative product, this negative first multiplication. Now, if we go up one step to the zeroth multiplication, so the zeroth multiplication between u and v, so this is very, very close to being a Lie algebra structure. So maybe we'll write that down. So this is close to being a Lie product. So in other words, it satisfies a Jacobi identity and all of that kind of stuff. So let's see what we've got here. Right in the middle, the negative first multiplication is close to being an associative commutative algebra. And the zeroth multiplication is close to being a Lie product. That means if you put these two things together, you get something that is close to being a Poisson algebra. So let's go ahead and write that. So close to a Poisson algebra. And in fact, you can actually like mod V out by a certain vector subspace and you will get exactly a Poisson algebra. And it's actually a really important Poisson algebra attached to a vertex algebra known as like the Zhu C2 algebra for what it's worth. Okay, now let's talk about all of the other products because there are most definitely some more products. There's like the negative second product of U and V, the negative third product of U and V, and so on and so forth. And then there's also the first product of U and V, the second product of U and V, and so on and so forth up in that direction. So these are all just further generalizations of the associative commutative product in this direction and the Lie product in that direction. So they veer off being further and further away from exactly the associative commutative product, but they're generalizations. So maybe we'll say further generalizations of this associative 
commutative product. Great. And then these guys up here, so all of the positive products, those are gonna be generalizations of the Lie product. So that's what's going on here. You wanna think of it like this. In the center of the vertex algebra, not like the algebraic center, like a really careful uh, defined thing, but in the middle of all of the multiplications, you've got something that's close to being a Poisson algebra. And as you move down in this direction, you're generalizing the associative or commutative multiplication. And as you're moving up in that direction, you're generalizing the Lie product. Now there's one thing that I've left off, and that is, well, how does this T operator come in, this translation operator? And this is going to be very, very loose, but loosely the translation operator moves you down this list. So loosely, if you take this associative commutative product and you do the T operator to it, you go down into this like negative second multiplication and so on and so forth. And this like goes all the way up here. So loosely the T operator is getting you down this ladder. Okay, so maybe I'll go ahead and clean up the board and very, very quickly maybe address why we would want this thing to exist in the first place.